Warriors! It's Coach JB, your top health and mindset coach in the world. Remember what you believe in your heart, you think in your mind, will eventually become your words, become your reality. I'm here to talk to you about the digital currency space, the fourth industrial revolution, moving into the quantum financial system. But first, you can follow me on Instagram at CoachJV underscore, where I just go unhinged. And also my podcast, where I'm absolutely unhinged, the Coach JV podcast. Just type it into Google. You'll find it everywhere. All right, guys. So I want to share with you guys my actual mission and purpose, okay? So... I could tell you guys about hot coins and I could tell you guys about uh, technical analysis and I can tell you that you're going to get rich in crypto, which a lot of people are and a lot of our warriors are and we're doing really well, right? But here's the thing. Unless you understand economics and what's actually happening in the world and starting to understand that as you look this way, there's a whole nother narrative happening this way, you're just going to be a hot coin chaser. And you're never going to actually build true generational wealth because to build true generational wealth, you have to know what the wealthy are doing. They're not doing what you're doing, warriors. There is a system that has been built for you to lose straight up, warriors. And now how can I rightfully say this? I spent 12 years in banking. And when I had my awakening, it was when I was in executive banking school, CBA executive banking school, where you learn how to scale banks from the ground up. And I started to question everything in banking. Now, I'm not saying bankers are bad. I'm not saying banks are, there's not, there's just certain things that were set up in a system that we live in that are not okay. And I'm going to show you a video and I, uh, this has been shown on a lot of YouTubers videos in the crypto space, but I've seen them show it, but I'm going to break down from you from a banking perspective and a reality perspective of what this means. So you can understand where your economy is heading and where it's going to be switching to. We are moving to the fourth industrial revolution. That is moving from industrial to technical. Think about from earth to air, okay? So that's number one. Number two is your banking system. And it's not gonna, people are like, oh, it's gonna, everything's gonna switch. The great reset's gonna happen this year. It's already happening. It's been happening for a long time, Warriors. But people that are saying there's gonna be a switch hit and all of a sudden you're on a new banking system, they're wrong. They're, they're really wrong. It's gonna take a while to implement this, Warriors. Yes, there's switches being hit to move us to the quantum financial system, but you're not going to have a wake up on a Monday morning and all of a sudden you're going to be in the new quantum finance. It's slowly already happening right now. It's a long methodical process. Kevin and I are business owners. We own a business. We make decisions years out. We've already made decisions for the future on what we're doing. We're already planning something for September and then we'll be planning something for 2022. That's what you do as business owners. And think about it. When you have 7 billion people in the world, you're not making a decision where you hit a switch and wake up and all of a sudden you're on the quantum financial system. You're already running on those, some of those rails, warriors. It's slowly and methodically happening. Here's why I'm saying this. None of the CBCs that have been launched except the Bahamas, fully launched as Bahamas, right? They test small countries first. China's going to launch in 2022. So how are they going to hit a switch in 2021 and there's nobody with their CBDC out yet except the Bahamas? So I want to give you reality warriors and I want to teach you the game so you can't be played. So I do have a Warrior Academy. The link's down below where we show exit strategies, which you have to have an exit strategy where you're going to get wrecked in the marketplace. We also have access to my portfolio. You have a ecosystem of warriors, 950 warriors worldwide helping each other. The most part is we don't just do the crypto part is we focus on mind, body, and soul. You have a 120 day challenge. You work out with us live daily, nutrition, habit stacking, goal setting, vision board creation. If you immerse yourself in this, your life will change in 120 days. But I tell you, don't believe a word I say. I'm not a financial advisor, not financial advice. I'm just a cool ass dude that's showing you exactly what I'm doing and how I built success in my life. If you want to roll with some warriors, then click the link down below. Okay, so let's watch this first video. I love this video. Now look at the date. This was in May 21st, 2013. Okay, this is when this happened. Think about the date. Now 2008, I'm going to teach you the game. In 2008, we had one of the biggest collapses in financial history. That was the start of the Great Reset. What you have to ask yourself, actually, you don't have to ask yourself anything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this video from 2013. This guy goes off in the parliament. And then I'm going to fast forward to the uh, Treasury Secretary hearings. And you're actually going to listen to the lady go after Janet Yellen about these things. You're, it's literally happening in real time wars. The ecosystem, your, uh, your, your banking system is about to collapse, but, but you're not watching any of this. You're getting stimulus checks sent to your account. 
in about July, I think 2021, that they're going to start helping pay for DIG. You're heading towards UBI. They're getting you used to relying on the government. So there's going to be a massive separation in between the rich, which that's going to be us, the uncommon 1%, and the poor. There will be no middle class. I will tell you that straight up. You're going to come back to this video and be, I should have listened to this guy. So let's watch this video and then I'm going to teach you the game. EFT, Mr. Bloom has two minutes. Uh, well, uh, Commissioner, um, Mr. President, uh, I rise again, I'm afraid, to make the same old hoary speech that I've been making here for several years, and that is, it is my opinion that you do not really understand the concept of banking. All the banks are broke. Uh, Bank Santander, Deutsche Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, they're all broke. And why are they broke? It isn't an act of God. It isn't some sort of tsunami. They're broke because we have a system called fractional reserve banking, which means that banks can lend money that they don't actually have. It's a criminal scandal, and it's been going on for too long. Okay, so let's stop for a moment. So we've seen this video before, but what did you say? Fraction, I've been telling you guys, it's a Ponzi scheme, right? Okay, so base the basics of fractional reserve banking. And let me explain this to you guys. I've done this on my podcast, I've explained this. Let me explain to you how fractional reserves work so you understand the game, so you can understand the system that you're in and how fragile it is and how it's so close to breaking. Okay, so when you're getting these stimulus checks, you should not be celebrating that words. It is not a good thing, okay? So when Bobby deposits $1,000 into this bank, okay, the bank, that's your money. That's Bobby's money, puts $1,000 into the bank, okay? They only have to hold $100 of that money. They get to take $900 of Bobby's money and lend it out to Susie. Now, Susie takes that $900, that's your money, and actually takes it to Bank B. And she deposits $900 into Bank B. Now, remember, that's Bobby's money. Now, Susie, Susie's bank, Bank B, only has to hold $90 of her money, okay? Now, remember, this is a, still $1,000 of Bobby's money. So now they lend out to Joe, I might mess up the names, Joe $810. Joe takes that money and bebops over to Bank C. Now, Bobby put $1,000 in. Now, Joe is depositing $810 of Bobby's money, and that bank only has to hold $81, 10%. They lend out $729 to Julie, and Julie does the same thing. That was $1,000 that got lent over and over and over and over again. It is not the bank's money. It is your money. They're lending out your money, and they only have to hold a fraction of your money. So if we were all to go to the banks right now and withdraw our cash that we have, they would not have your money. That is fractional reserve lendings. If we did that, we would be in jail. To add to that problem... You have moral hazard, a very significant moral hazard from the political sphere. And most of the problem starts in politics and central banks, which are part of the same political system. We have counterfeiting, sometimes called quantitative easing, but counterfeiting by any other name. The artificial printing of money, which of any... So what are you getting? Stimulus checks. Since 2009, the inception of Bitcoin, more money has been printed than in history. And during the pandemic, more money was printed in the first three months than in world history. Any ordinary person did, they'd go to prison for a very long time. And yet governments and central banks do it all the time. Central banks repress the amount of interest that rate, rates are, so we don't have the real cost of money. And yet we blame the real retail banks for manipulating LIBOR. The sheer effrontery of the blamed retail banks for manipulating LIBOR. Let's talk about the LIBOR scandal. Many of you probably don't know what the hell LIBOR is. LIBOR is switching from LIBOR to CIFOR this year. That is a massive change that you don't know about. We are moving from a fraudulent LIBOR system that determines your interest rates with a bunch of central banks sipping some whiskey. There was a LIBOR scandal and we're now switching to CIFOR, which is going to rock the system. They have no idea what it's going to do to the system. That's how you regulate interest rates. Without arrogant disregard for the rulers, traders, colluded for years 
to rig LIBOR, the bank's lending rate. But after the crash, the regulators were on their tail, okay? Um, at Tokyo headquarters of the Swiss bank of UBS, in the middle of a uh, desert trading floor, Tom Hayes sat rap before a bank of eight computer screens. Uh, collar school, pale, um, uh, features pinched, blonde hair mused from a habit of pulling at when he was deep in thought. The British trader was even more disheveled than usual. It was 15th of September, 2008, and it looked in Hayes' mind like the end of the world. Hayes has been woken up at a dawn in his apartment by a call from his boss, telling him to get off the office, get to the office immediately. In New York, Lehman Brothers was hurtling towards bankruptcy. Do you remember this, guys? At the desk, Hayes watched the world processing the news and panicking. As each market opened, it became a sea of flashing red. Investors frantically dumped their holdings in moments like this. Hayes entered an almost unconscious state, rapidly processing the tide of information before him and calculating calculating the best escape route. Hayes, um, Hayes was a phenomenon, or Hayes was a phenomenon at the UBS. One of the best in the bank, he had a trading derivative. So far, the mounting financial crisis had actually been good for him. The chaos had let him buy cheaply from those desperate to get out and sell high to the unlucky few who still needed to trade. While most dealers closed up their shop in fear, Hayes, with a seemingly limitless appetite for risk, stayed in. He was 28 and was up more than 70 million for the year. Okay. So now that he was under, now that that was under threat. Not only did Hayes have to extract himself from everyday deals that he had done with the Lehman Brothers, he had to also made a series of enormous bets that in the coming days, interest rates would remain stable. The collapse of Lehman Brothers, the fourth largest investment bank, would surely cause, uh, cause, the, uh, cause those rates, which were real just uh, barometers of risk. To spike, as Hayes examined his trading book, one rate mattered more than any other, the London Interbank Offer Rate of LIBOR, benchmark that influences 350 trillion of securities and loans around the world for traders such as Hayes. The number was the holy grail, and two years earlier, he discovered a way to rig it. LIBOR was a set of self-selected, self policing committee of the world's largest banks. The rate measured how much it would cost them to borrow from each other. Every morning, each bank submitted an estimate. An average was taken and a number was published midday. The process was repeated in different currencies and for various amounts of time, ranging from overnight to a year. During his time as a junior trader in London, Hayes had got to know several of the 16 individuals responsible for making their banks daily submissions for the Japanese yen. His flash of insight was releasing these men, mostly relied on their inner dealer brokers, the fast-talking middlemen involved in every trade for guidance on what to submit each day. Brokers are the middleman in the world of finance, facilitating deals between traders and different banks and every, everything from treasury bonds to over-the-counter derivatives. If a trader wants to buy or sell, he could theoretically ring the bell at the banks to get the price, or he could throw a broker who is in touch with everyone and find out the counterparty in seconds. Hardly a dollar change hands in the cash and derivatives market without a broker matching the deal and taking a cut. In the opaque, over-the-counter derivatives market, where there is no uh, centralized exchange, brokers are at the um, imp uh, what is it in pertice of the information flow that pulls them in a powerful position. Okay, only they can get a picture of what all the banks are doing. While the brokers had no official role in setting LIBOR, the rate setters at the bank relied on them for information on where cash was trading. Because of Hayes' intimacy with the numbers, his coworkers reminded or reminded him he was not like them they called him Raman <laughs> rain, rain man rain man most traders look down on the brokers and second-class citizens too Hayes uh, uh, rec uh, recognized his worth he saw that one of one one else did because he was different his intimacy with the numbers his cold embrace of risk and his unusual habits were more uh, professional ticks Hayes would not be uh, diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome until 2015. When he was 35, his co-workers and many of them savvy operators were fancy schools, often reminded Hayes that he was like them. They called him Rain Man. Now, do you guys remember what this is? Do you guys know what this story is? I believe this is the big short. Okay, now he saw that LIBOR, these people 
were manipulating the rates. They literally were deciding rates. Just let's just grab some whiskey. Hey, what do you want to charge today? Hey, Kev, what do you want to charge today? Let's charge this today. He figured out the system and did a big short. He was the one that made a ton of money off of the collapse of the market. Okay, so think about that, Warriors. This is what this gentleman is talking about. This is a system that you operate in. This is quite astonishing. It's central banks. It's central banks that manipulate interest rates, Commissioner. And plus, underneath all this, we talk loosely, in a rather cavalier fashion, do we not, about deposit guarantees. So when banks go broke through their own incompetence and chicanery, the taxpayer picks up the tab. Oh. It's theft from the taxpayer. And until we start sending bankers, and I include central bankers and politicians, to prison for this outrage, it will continue. Welcome to your world. Now, let's, now, now this is March 24th, on my birthday, 2021. This is a Treasury Secretary Yellen and Fed Chair Powell testifying before Congress. I want you to hear this conversation. Now that you know what you know, listen to the conversation. And from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So after the 2008 financial crisis, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Act to put more cops on the beat. I remember what we were just talking about LIBOR. This gentleman figured out the scam. And prevent Wall Street from wrecking our economy again. One of the protections that Dodd-Frank put in place was to automatically create a special designation for the too big to fail banks. At the time, those with assets of $50 billion or more. So they received stronger oversight by the Federal Reserve. Chair Powell, why did Congress think it was a good idea to put stronger oversight in place for banks above a certain size? Uh, I think it was a wise decision. It just it was um, particularly for the very largest institutions. It was clear at the time that we needed to raise expectations across a very broad range of measures, including particularly capital liquidity risk management. Okay, and we need a better supervision to do that, I take it. I would but, agree. But it isn't just banks that pose a risk to the economy. In 2008, two investment companies, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, failed, triggering the 2008 crash. So when Congress passed Dodd-Frank, they created the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, and gave it the power to designate non-bank firms as uh, too big to fail, or in the in the terms of the statute, to designate them as systemically important, which means they get the same stronger oversight as the too big to fail banks. Is that right, Chair Powell? Yes, it is. Okay. So let's look at an example of how that's working today. BlackRock is the world's largest asset management firm, overseeing nearly $9 trillion in assets. That's more than double where it was 10 years ago. It also holds a stake in just about every company listed on the S&P 500. To put that in perspective, BlackRock manages more assets than the entire GDP of Japan or Germany or Great Britain or any other nation in the world except the United States and China. And it's not just size. BlackRock also runs a technology platform that currently houses at least 10% of all the stocks and bonds around the world. So, Secretary Yellen. So, I've been teaching you that the stock market is rigged. Are you, you're hearing it from the horse's mouth. Hypothetically, if a $9 trillion investment company failed, would that likely have a significant impact on our economy? Well, Senator Warren, I believe it's important to look very carefully uh, at the risk posed by asset management industry, including BlackRock and other firms. And the FSOC began to do that, I believe, in 2016 and 2017. But the risks it focused on were ones having to do with um, open-end mutual funds that can um, experience massive withdrawals and be forced to sell off assets that could create fire sales. Right. That is actually a risk that we saw materialize um, last spring in March. And I think that with respect to asset management, rather than focus on designation of companies, I think it's important to focus on an activity like that and 
to consider what the appropriate um, restrictions are. Um, it, it's not obvious to me that um, designation is the correct is the correct tool to address. Well, the, now, wait just a minute. Designation is what gives the Fed its increased oversight power. Is that correct? Is that correct? Yes. And is BlackRock currently designated so that it receives that increased oversight? It, it isn't designated, but I think it's important to understand. So that means it is not receiving the increased oversight from the Fed. So my question is, are you currently looking at designation for companies like BlackRock, $9 trillion companies like this? Well, as I said, FSOC has looked at this issue in the I past. I understand they've done it in the past. I'm and not asking what the last Secretary of the Treasury did. You are the head of FSOC well, now. The and the, the question I'm asking is whether or not FSOC is considering and looking at designation for these large financial institutions. Well, I think it's appropriate to designate institutions whose failure would pose a material risk to Good. U.S. financial stability. And that's why stability. I started my question with, does potentially a $9 trillion investment company pose some risk to the American economy if it should fail? Well, one needs to analyze what the risk is. An asset management company is so very you, different how than you a bank. So analyze what the risk is if you're not actually doing the investigation through FSOC? Well, FSOC has undertaken such work in the past, and as I said, when it looked at asset managers, it issued a report outlining what it saw as some of the most significant. This doesn't alert you, Warriors. I don't know what the hell to tell you. If you're still watching this, you're true. I don't even know what else to say. If, if this doesn't make you think that you need to make some decisions, Warriors, <laughs> why do you think the banks are moving to central bank digital currencies? Why do you think? Do you see now the infrastructure that you're living in, a non-asset backed currency, the U.S. dollar was detached from the gold, gold standard in 1971. Since 2008, since Bitcoin was uh, inception of Bitcoin, a digital currency, more money's been printed than in history. And as you look this way at a pandemic, more money was printed in the first two months of the pandemic than in history. And the 634 richest people in the world became way more wealthy as you became poor and waited for your stimulus check. So, Warriors, you have a decision to make. You can sit back and ignore this and push us under the rug. You're literally watching them argue back and forth of what they talked about in that video in 2013. So you have a decision to make, Warriors. You can sit and bury your head in the sand, or you can really take control of your family's life right now. So that's what I am. That's why I'm investing in the quantum financial system. That's why I'm in the cryptocurrency space. It's not about just a quick buck. We're investing in the future of our world, the new Web3, Interledger Protocol the internet of things. You have an opportunity right now to change your family's life. This is not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor, Warriors. This is some serious times, and I'm here to bring the information to you. Warriors, rise. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share this video with a friend. Let's go.